Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. You know, you made that little joke, I'll tell you something. Oh. Russell Stump, a Roman County mm -hmm. preacher, good friend of mine, school teacher, actually asked me one time, I said, Preacher Mike, if the rapture occurs today, would, would you come out and mow my grass tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, thank you, Brother Nathaniel, for allowing me the privilege to come stand behind God's pulpit. I just hope I pray that I can say something that will touch someone's heart and their mind. If you have your Bibles, look, you can follow along and listen to me. Over in the 23rd chapter of the book of Luke. And uh, we'll start there about verse 35. And Christ is on the cross. And the people stood beholding. And the rulers also with them derided him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself if, it, if he be Christ, the chosen of God. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar. And saying, if thou be the king of the Jews, say, save thyself. And a superscription also was written over him in letters of Greek and Latin and the Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. And one of the malefactors, now this is the part I want you to pay close attention to. And one of the malefactors, which was hanged, railed on him, saying, if thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other, answering, uh, rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, Remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily, which means truly, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Amen. I don't know whether you know it or not, but mankind has an enemy. We face him every day. We call him. Old smutty face, we call him the devil. And the devil has many things in this world to uh, distract us. <laughs> Occupy our minds with so many different things. Except what's important. You take, for example, right now what's going on in the Middle East. You need to pray for Israel, by the way. God's chosen people. Amen. He's in Genesis 12, he says, I'll bless them that bless thee, and I'll yep. curse them that curse mm -hmm. And in thee shall all nations of the world be blessed. Me and Christ would come through the seed of Abraham, and which he did through the tribe of Judah. And so, uh, there's that middle. I mean, right now, you know, Israel has been bombing them, and we bombed uh, Yemen the other day. The, I think that's what they're called. And uh, Iran's dropped drones on them, and, and we can think a lot about that. And of course, uh, Hezbollah has been losing a lot of their leaders. What a shame. And, and so, hope you understand sarcasm. By the way, I, the really great preacher will be preaching tomorrow night. I just want you to know that. So, uh, and Then there's the situation in Taiwan. China is wanting to take over Taiwan, which became a nation after Chiang Kai-shek was forced out, and they went over there and created nationalist China, and of course they want a one-China policy, and, and we have uh, covenanted with Taiwan to protect them, and World War III could break out at any moment, folks. Amen. 
Of course, there's always what's going on in our own nation. My goodness sakes. Occupy our mind. You know, how many illegal aliens have come in, or COVID-19, or whatever it is, Satan wants you to think about that and not Christ. There's all the various wars that are going on in the world. I don't even like to watch the news. You know that? Amen. I've got a friend, preacher friend of mine. You know who I'm talking about. Elizabeth Cedarville. He calls me, and he's always in a bad mood. I said, you've been watching the news again, haven't you? <laughs> I do. I mean, there's a whole plethora. That's a, yeah. You know, that, that's a word means a lot. Okay, there's a whole plethora of places that we can focus our attention on. But in this, this little bit of sermon that I attempt to make tonight, I want to, you to focus your attention on a theological area. Now, many would consider this area not important, but it's the most important thing in the world. There, they would say, uh, this theological issue that I want to discuss tonight is the kind that college professors would just dismiss like that. Now, let me tell you something. I, this sounds like I'm bragging, but I'm not. I have seven college degrees. I would trade them all for what my daddy knew in his little finger. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. I mean, my dad could electric well, sodaline well, plumb a house, build a house, you know, kind of like Charlie McCown back there. Okay? <laughs> And so, uh, this theological area, they would say, well, that doesn't heal marriages, or, or it doesn't help in rearing children, or it doesn't help in personal matters. Oh, I beg the difference, okay? There's no more practical subject area than what I'm asking you to ponder on tonight. This theological area uh, will heal the wounds of the human family. The wounds of guilt. I don't know about you, but there are some things in my past I, I wish I'd never done. There are things, we have wounds of anxiety, don't we? The wounds of depression. You know, my wife had a baby after her first baby, and sometimes the women. You know, they're, when they're pregnant, they have all those hormones flowing, you know. And then the baby's delivered, and now all of a sudden those hormones stop flowing. It's like you just go off a drug. And she went into depression after that. She once said to me, Dave, now she says she never said this. I know she did. <laughs> <laughs> You've never done anything to me, but I hate you. Okay. Uh, but that was just depression. Did you know, I mean, the earth just filled up with 8 billion people. And they say about 5% of that people in the world's people are depressed. That's 400 million people. I think I did my math right. Okay. Anyway, all false doctrine. By the way, the word doctrine simply means teaching. And a young preacher said, no, I, I don't preach no doctrine. That's what he told me. <laughs> and I thought, I means you don't preach anything. Mm -hmm. yeah. Jesus well, said, my doctrine. Now, Jesus yeah. said he had a doctrine. He my did. doctrine is not mine, but him that sent me. Amen. Yeah. So, to me, doctrine is not a bad word, but I do want to warn you, there is false doctrine. Yes. But there's also true doctrine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, anyway... Uh, all false doctrine is, can be revealed to be false. You can come see if you look at, consider what I'm talking about tonight. See, Satan wants to convince you that sin is not sin. Satan wants to convince you that the world is in no need of repentance. And I say... That's what they need more than anything else. Mm -hmm. Oh, I can hear it now. Oh, you're one of those turn and burn preachers. <laughs> turn and burn. Guilty as charged. Uh, so I want to talk about the correct teaching. Uh, I want to talk about the cross, okay? How 
it will make sure that that's sound doctrine. Now, I want to say this. There's no neutral ground. Did you hear me? There's no neutral ground Amen. concerning the cross of Calvary. Amen. In Luke 11, 23, Jesus said, He that is not with me is against me. And he that gathereth not with me scatters. There are people who say, well, I, I, I'm, I'm not for Jesus, but I'm not against him either. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're either for him or you're against him. Yeah. Amen. 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 Oh, I, I'm going to tell you right now, I have made people mad when I say that you're either saved or you're lost. Yeah, that's right. You know, you can't get anybody saved until you get them to realize that they're first lost. Amen. Amen. That's the truth. You're either saved or you're lost. I don't know your condition tonight. If there's any one person in this world that does not deserve to be saved, it's my goodness. But I want you to consider now the cross. I want to look at two reactions about what people can react to the cross and the message of the cross. Rejection. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 1. Now, I may say this to the young people. You mean you preach directly at somebody? Yeah, I would. In Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 1, it says, And remember thy Creator... In the days of the, thy youth, before the evil days come, mm -hmm. and the years draw nigh of which thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. See, Satan just wants you to reject. Put off one more night. Mm -hmm. just, just put it off one more night, the decision for Christ. Mm -hmm. Knowing that the longer you stay, in the world. The longer you stay out there without Christ, the more hardened your heart will mm -hmm. become. Yeah, Amen. That's, Amen. The truth. That's the truth. The sun is an interesting thing, you know. I mean, it can harden the clay. That's the butter, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Depends on the condition of the heart, doesn't mm -hmm. it? So the first fella, okay. Uh, he represents the hardened sinner, this first thief. I'm going to talk about those two thieves. What were his deeds? Well, he was a malefactor. That means someone who commits a crime against society. Today, we would use the word felon. He's a criminal. And we see his derision. He railed against Jesus. That word means to speak evil or to blaspheme. He's he is dying, and he's just so full of hate, all he can do is mock Jesus. The reason, that, that's, you know, that's found in another verse in the Bible. Over in Psalms 2, 4, the reason means to laugh at with contempt. Over there in Psalms. And this is what it says. He that sitteth in the heavens. Well, who's that talking about? That's talking about God. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. There's coming a day they mock Jesus and they criticize Jesus and so on. There's coming a day when the shoes are going to be on the other foot. And they have their opportunity and they didn't take it. Mm -hmm. I want to tell you a hardened sinner can be highly educated. Yes, he can. Yeah. Many are. Trust me, he's a college student over here. He's graduated college. You've had more than one hardened professor, haven't you? Yes. He had a professor that tried to say that the Old Testament was all allegorical, didn't he? Let me tell you about this college professor. He's a Evolutionary biologist in South Africa. Don't let titles affect you. Okay? Don't be impressed with titles. His name is Richard Dawkins. He's quite an old man now. 
wrote a book called The God Delusion. And this is what he wrote. Now you talk about blasphemy. You talk about being hardened in sin. He says the God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all of fiction. The Bible is not fiction. Jealous and proud of it, petty, unjust, unforgiving, control freak. A vindictive, bloodthirsty, ethnic cleanser. A misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, genocidal, uh, philicidal, pestilential, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, capriciously malevolent bully. What? That's what he said about God. You know what? Let me just turn to one verse. You know, that's the kind of God that Jonah wanted God to be. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jonah was told to go over to that wicked city of Nineveh and preach. And he did. And guess what happened? A revival broke out mm -hmm. in that city. Mm -hmm. And Jonah wasn't happy about it. He I, I, I can't understand that. Why would anybody be unhappy with anybody who got saved? Yeah. This is what he said in, in, in 4 2 in Jonah. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled. Then he said, For unto. Uh, for unto uh, uh, for unto Tarshish, for I know that's what he said about the Old Testament God, this terrible male malevolent bully that this evolutionary biologist said. He says, for I know that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger, of great kindness, and repentance thee of the evil. They go, how I heard this, how many times? How can you reconcile, reconcile that mean, vicious God of the Old Testament with the loving God of the New Testament? I said, what mean, vicious God of the Old Testament? Mm -hmm. Well, anyway, uh, this man, this first thief, we look at his doubt. And that's revealed in the true, his true, his true attitude is found in one little word, if, if I'll be the son of God. Mm -hmm. That's what agnostics say. Well, I don't know that there is a God, but I, I, I don't know that there is a God. Let me tell you something. They're lost. Amen. Yes. Amen. Now, you say, what a tragedy about this man. Well, let me just make a confession. That man, he, uh, he just was worthy to be saved as I was. Mm -hmm. But now, you're a preacher. Don't, don't tell me that. I'm a mortal man, a sinner saved by grace. Amen. Now, I'm going to show you a person in Ephesians chapter 2. I want to read the first four verses. And you hath he quickened, that means made alive, who were dead. That's what I was, preacher. I was spiritually dead. Dead mm -hmm. without Christ. If you're not here say, with, and you never put faith in Christ, you're spiritually dead. Mm -hmm. You cannot please God. Separate and apart from Christ. You cannot come to God on your terms. You come to God on His terms. Don't you? Amen. Wherefore, in times past, you walk according to the force of this world, according to the prince and power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Among whom... Also, we all had our conversation, that means our lifestyle, in time past, in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. That was me before I came to Christ. I still battle. Now, I'm going to tell you something. When you become a Christian, the world will put this walk on water syndrome on you like you're supposed to just be perfect. And it's always according to their standard what they yes. think is perfect. Mm -hmm. yes. In the seventh chapter of the book of uh, Romans, Paul's talking about the two natures. And he's talking about 
I would do that which is good, he said, I find not. When I would do good, evil was present with me. And so then he, he gets the spiritual victory over in Romans chapter 8 when he finds himself being yielded to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. You have two natures in that. I heard a story one time, Charlie, about this Eskimo. He had one dog that was pure white, and the other dog was pure black, exactly the same. And he would go to town every Saturday. The two dogs fought. The two dogs hated each other. And he would go every Saturday and they would vote, uh, you know, make their bets as to which dog would win. Sometimes the white dog would win. Sometimes the black dog would win. And so he would just go clean out that city every time. Well, they got tired of that. And they said, we're not going to play this game anymore. We're not going to do this anymore. We just know one thing. Because he always knew which dog would win. He said, how, do you, how did you know which dog would win? Well, that's just through the week I'd feed the one and start the other. <laughs> and that's what it is with the mm -hmm. Christian. If you yeah. feed the flesh, mm -hmm. the flesh will be stronger. Yeah. But if you feed the spirit, yes. Yes. the spirit will be stronger. Amen. So, yeah, they go, well, you know, I, I don't know that I can... Listen. You, you Christians, all you have is faith. You show me concrete proof, and I'll believe. That's not what God requires. You don't get to set the rules. God sets the rules. Amen. Amen. Well, by grace are you saved through faith, that none of yourselves is a gift of God, not of works, lest same man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, and the good works that God has before ordained that we should walk in them. Hebrews chapter 1, 11, verse 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things so for, the evidence of things not seen. God says, I want you to believe, even though there's no concrete proof. And so, this fella, he was not worthy of salvation. No man has ever been worthy of salvation. Amen. No different than all the multitudes that live around us today. But then there's the Reception of the cross. This second fella, two thieves and gone off his hill. He's the honest sinner. I actually be honest tonight. Are you saved? Honest, be honest with you with yourself. Are, are you saved tonight? There are millions of lost people in this world that are honest, hardworking people whose lives. I live just as good as many Christians. Mm -hmm. But they're lost without Christ. Amen. Yeah. Here's the thing. Psalms 14, verse 3. They've all gone aside. They all they are to get all together become corrupt. There is none that doeth good. Not even one. If there was even one person that could live what God wants them to live, Christ would not have. That died on the cross of Calvary. Amen. Amen. So, we look at this fellow, and uh, here we see his admission. You know, they're mocking Jesus. By the way, he, he, he had earlier mocked Christ, okay? Uh, Let Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross that we may see and believe. That, that's exactly the way they say it today. Well, will you give me proof that I'll believe? It's not what God wants, okay? But he had come to himself, like the prodigal son, had come to himself, and he said, well, wait a minute. We're guilty. There had to come a day. I had to realize, you're guilty. And so, we're getting what we, he said, we're getting what we deserve. He was under conviction because of his sin. But he was an honest man. So his, his assessment was vastly different from the first thief. The first thief was looking out. He was looking for a way out. This fellow was looking for a way in. Amen. He wanted to get Amen. into the Amen. kingdom of God. Okay? Yes. And so he, he, he says, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And guess what? There was this promise made. You know, his appeal 
That was an incredible request, okay? Jesus is wearing a crown of thorns, but he wants Jesus to be on the throne over his heart. When one puts faith in Christ, when one puts faith on the cross of Calvary for their personal cross of redemption, uh, you know, when they have recession, when they receive that, that cross becomes a cross of redemption. Now, let's talk about Christ for a little bit. There is a song, Psalms 22. It's called the Psalm of the Cross. One thousand years before it happened, all seven of those statements that Christ made on those final seven statements are made or can be found directly quoted in that psalm or psychologically in the background. And so, uh, there's a passage of scripture, and it's in Second Corinthians five twenty one. For we have made him, not God the Father, having made Jesus, for we have made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Amen. A double transference takes place. All of our sins are taken and covered by the blood. And his perfect record, his perfect life, is applied to our record as if, as if we did it ourselves. You know, I, I get amazed at people. Brother, they, I, 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 I just want what I deserve. Hmm. Not me. Amen. I'll take grace. I'll amen. take mercy. Yeah, amen. Yes. I don't want what I deserve. No. If I did, I'd wind up in hell. Yeah, that's right. Well, anyway, it's always been that way. I'd like to remind you about the plagues in Egypt. The first nine were directed against the gods of Egypt. And uh, the last one was against Pharaoh himself and the, and the firstborn. Except that the firstborn didn't die in the house of Israel. Why was that? Because they said, this is what you do. You take the blood of the lamb and you put it on the doorpost and lentils of that house. And when the death angel flies over, if he sees the blood applied to the doorposts and lentils, he'll fly over. Amen. Amen. You know, that angel did not go down in and look as to who was in that house. Then, by the way, when they came up out of there, the Bible says there were mixed multitudes. Yeah, there must right. have been a lot of them in those houses. Mm -hmm. He didn't go, oh my goodness, look there. There's a rabbi Bowen. I have to say, but I have to let that rascal go. You know, he didn't do that. He just looked to see if the blood was applied. Mm -hmm. yeah. In the day of judgment, when Christ judges us, has his blood been applied to the doorposts and mantles of your heart by faith? Yes. That's the question I asked you, okay? And uh, so, and, and the Lord's gracious, okay? Luke 18, 19 and 10, I'm sorry. For the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. Amen. How much he loves you. And he said, he had this promise. Well, you might after a while wind up with me. That's not what Jesus said. No. This day mm -hmm. shall thou be with me in paradise. That same promise is extended to you today. Amen. What do you see when you look at the cross of Calvary? Well, let me tell you a little story in closing. There was a great Spanish painter in 632 AD. His name was Diego Valenzuela. Valenzuela, I'll get it right. Great painter. He painted a picture, a painting, Christ on the cross. And so he had it hanging in his studio. A little gypsy girl came in. She was looking at that painting and said, she didn't know about Jesus, you know. He must have been a wicked man. And the great artist said, no, no. He was the best man ever. He died for the sins of other people. And the little girl 
looked at paintings more after he said that. And the little girl said to the great painter, he must have loved you very much to have done that for you. That so convicted the great painter's heart, but guess what? He accepted Christ and became a Christian. I ask you this, do you realize how much Jesus loves you? That he would go to the cross for you to suffer the most agonizing death ever invented. It was invented by the Phoenicians, but it was perfected by the Romans. Cruel death, slow suffocation. And so he fulfilled prophecy. You know, they came to him that the other fellows, they broke their bones, you know, so that they couldn't lift them. That's what crucifixion is, you know. He nailed their feet to the thing there. And and then they put their, to get air into his lungs, he had to constantly lift himself up and down against those nails, okay? When they broke the bones, and they couldn't lift themselves up and down him. But they came to Jesus, and he was already deceased. And not one bone was broken. By the way, that's fulfilling prophecy. <laughs> well, do you see that in Jesus? How he allowed himself to be made sin so that you might be saved. Do you understand that he uh, allowed himself to suffer like that so that you could avoid the fires of hell? People go, I had a man ask me, what's it mean to be saved? It means you didn't wind up in hell. Amen. You're saved from hell. Amen. Do you see, when you look at Calvary, where Galgotha's tree was, do you see that your past has been erased? Huh? And that you have a new future? How many have ever heard of Carol Robertson? <laughs> singer. My wife wanted to go down here. And, and I talked to him a little bit. I tall. I got tall. And... Uh, we were talking about salvation, and his wife's a little short, blonde-haired lady, and uh, I said, you know, when a person is born again into God's family, they're like a newborn baby. They no longer have a past. Did your wife, how many babies did you have? I know I had several of your kids at class. How many did you have? Four. Okay. Did she once, ever once, hold up that baby and say, I'll never forgive you for your past. Hmm. Why? They don't have a past. Okay? And neither does someone who has a past. So forget about your past. It's under the blood. Mm -hmm. Will you be saved tonight? Mm -hmm. That's what Jesus did for you. Why? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believed in him shall not perish but have everlasting. How do you measure that little adverb, so? For God, so. That's an infinite adverb, folks. Will you be saved tonight? Let's have a song. Number 51. 51. Brother Todd picked this one out. He didn't even know what you were preaching. Tonight. That's how the Holy Spirit works. <laughs> Number 51. <clears throat> On a hill far away stood an old brown cross the meaning of suffering and shame went to the cross and I rub that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners so I cherish the old rugby cross Till my throat is at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugby cross And exchange its 